This evening we have several minor tasks to perform. One of which is to survey a little more of the historical side of alchemy. At this time, by paralleling the rise of alchemical tradition in North Africa <coughs> and its development among the Chinese. Chinese alchemy is quite different in spirit, methodology, from the European approach to this subject. And because of its comparative antiquity and the way in which it developed, we may have a clue to the obscure origin of European alchemy. We've already noted that the great rise of the alchemistical symbolism with its extravagance in use of emblematic devices and elaborate formulas, coinciding with the rise of the other mystical schools in Europe, and it should not be regarded as an agent as is popularly supposed. Now in China we find what may well be uh, the building up of the pattern that finally led to the rise of European symbolical alchemy. In China, this mystical art is associated with the cult of Taoism. So we'll have to examine for a moment Chinese philosophy, where in China, alchemy stems directly from philosophy, a link which we do not have in the West. We're not sure of the relation of these groups. But from the study of the Chinese, we may well begin to re-evaluate our Western historical approach. Taoism arising as the result of the teachings of the obscure Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu passed through three distinct stages in its development. The first, the philosophical, the second, the transcendental, and the third, the theological. Uh, these periods are roughly divided into about six to seven hundred year periods. Uh, each of these sections would thereby correspond to something resembling 600 years of development and systematic uh, re-adaptation. In the first 600 years of Taoism, the sect was essentially philosophical and essentially a very high form of Eastern absolutism. And Lao Tzu was not only a mystic, but a very profound theist in his interpretation <coughs> of the essential principle of Tao, or universal being. Hardly had Lao Tzu passed on before his followers, disciples, and several other Chinese scholars who became distinguished in the descent system, began to expand and elaborate the essential principles which he had taught. This period of expansion resulted in several recensions of the basic texts of the Jews and terminated about the beginning of the Christian era, or shortly thereafter. During this first period, we have a parallel with the first period in Buddhist philosophy, which was essentially a powerful ethical agnosticism. Uh, but gradually, it became evident in popular usage uh, that the abstract principles of pure philosophy did not have sufficient vitality for masses to result in any strong development of sects or groups. The pure philosophy was simply too deep for the average person and did not come close enough to his own living experience. That was a gradual transition took place in which a series of compromises by interpretation increased the <coughs> romanticism of otherwise abstract mystical learning. So beginning around the 1st century AD and continuing to the 5th, 7th century, Taoism passed through what we would call a transcendental or purely metaphysical period. And it was in this period that alchemy arose among the Chinese. And it arose among these Taoist monks 
and scholars and sages who began to finish as much as it can concerning the essential teachings of the original uh, master, the ancient master. If universal consciousness, which was the goal, was to be achieved by man, then there must be certain methods or means whereby this consciousness can be more closely associated with the human being. And the Taoists, taking the attitude based upon um, a very brief statement in the Tao Te Ching, <coughs> came to the conclusion that Tao, or a universal life agent, the universal principle, existed in everything but was more abundant in some things than in others. Therefore, in order to increase Tao in the all consciousness of life being within the individual, he should gradually associate himself with those things in which this principle was most abundant. It comes very close to the Paracelsian theory of Buddha. The certain living things had a larger share of this essential energy than other things. We believe that in a, a different way on a scientific level today. We believe, for example, that certain foods contain more nutrition than others. And to the Chinese, nutrition, the essential element of nutrition, on basis of it, was God or life. Therefore, we are a little bit unhappy today over overly refined sugar and overly refined flour and various homogenized dairy products because we doubt their vitamin or vitality content. So the Chinese in this early period were speculating as to the essential elements <coughs> or deprivation of nutrients or nutrition within the various elements of food and the various means uh, of <coughs> concentrating Tao within the body of the human being. So we began to speculate like this. What are the principal ways in which energy can come to the person and be distributed throughout his body and nature so that he may unfold or grow or come nearer uh, to the full uh, expression of his Tao content? And the Chinese came to several conclusions. They divided this field into three essential parts. The first uh, they called breath. Now, the moment they began to talk about Tao and breath, they began to come very close to the yogic systems of India. They held in China that Tao was in the air, and therefore that to inhale was to accept Tao into yourself. This is the breath of life, or the living breath. Air in its eternal circulation was symbolical of the endless motion of the Tao principle in the universe. So the problem was to increase the intake of air, which they did by various disciplines. Also, through the development of esoteric arts, uh, to use the will or the consciousness to distribute this air within the body so that it could be more rapidly brought into direct contact with vital organs nerve centers and brain centers. Uh, they started in, for example, with a formula like this, that the disciples had struck in by inhaling and then counting this heartbeat <coughs> before exhaling again. He would start by inhaling, holding his breath, and counting his heartbeat up to a hundred. Every time he should exhale. By doing so, he would increase uh, the duration of the energy principle from the air to remain longer within you. Also, at the same time, if we gather more uh, negative or useless material to be disposed of. In other words, the Chinese would think of this process of body cleansing through breath. They held that the sage, through practice over a period of years, could finally reach the point where he could hold the breath and count to 1,000, which would be quite a long time, probably two or three minutes. And also, during this period of time, uh, would accomplish what they call body cleansing. 
Now the second part of that was that God is absolute good. And you can uh, estimate the parallel between, for instance, this Chinese policy and Western calisthenics. You can see a good Westerner get up in front of the window, open it up, be down his chair, take a deep breath, and back to his clothes. <laughs> this is a way of doing everything. It's not stopped by me. <laughs> but then the West is not stopped. <laughs> but the dollar is well stopped. So he told them what to do. He said, before you do this breathing process, you can take a feather and suspend it on a very fine thread or hair about six inches in front of your face. And in the process of both inhaling and exhaling, you must not disturb the feather's motion. You mustn't cause it to sway or sway or move. In other words, you must both inhale and exhale very quietly, without any sense of pressure. You must not hold the breath until you burst and it all comes out in one fell swoop that would blow the feather across the street. You have to do this all very quickly, very subtly. There must be no obvious breath. There must be no obvious exertion. It must be gradually to bring this process completely within the control of the will. And the breath moves so quietly, so silently, so subtly, that only those who are well acquainted with the system could even detect that you were breathing. Thus, breath becomes absolutely smooth, as the Chinese call it. And by so doing, you have less and less human interference with this motion or rhythm. So the breath was one way in which they thought to cleanse and transform the internal part of the body. Now, the second thing they recommended was, of course, diet. And in the case of diet, they had some very strange ideas. For example, the Chinese rejected all grain. Instead of wheat being the fat rice or all that type of thing, they rejected grains of all kinds, the five grains which they knew. They said that they let the grains were detrimental to bowel. They uh, insisted mostly upon fruit and green vegetables and foods that were exceedingly light. They found that any weight of food within the body, even though this weight might be of a very solid and substantial nutritive quality, was too coarse, too uh, mundane, uh, to serve the purposes of Tao. That the universal energy principle found in plants was most easily assembled directly from a living plant that was uncooked, and that it was also assembled from the plant itself, rather than from its fruit or seed. That was the stalk, the stem, the leaf, the flower, was more abundant in Tao than the, than the final uh, consummation of this planet in its fruit or seed. Because in the process of transforming into its final fruit or seed, a transition occurred in the nature of Tao, and it was not so readily available to the body. Thus the Chinese held that universal life could be quickly taken in to certain kinds of types of plants and plant life. And in their mystical speculations, they listed a number of food products uh, which were definitely powerful in this uh, element of Tao. <coughs> now, the third um, phase of their research dealt with what they called discipline. Having uh, used breath as one means, having used food intake as a third, as a second, the third was the actual use of the mind and the consciousness itself to draw or collect Tao. We then come in again to a very mystical expression of their concept or doctrine. Not only did they use the attention of consciousness to draw this energy, but they then moved this consciousness throughout their own bodies, directing Tao and distributing it by a voluntary action of the will. But whether it was the food or the breathing or the consciousness, it all had to be very rhythmic, very subtle, with a minimum of action of, of any kind, a floating of life upon the surface of action, never for a moment this tremendous intensity with which we associate activity in the West. Now the purpose of these three disciplines was uh, the achievement of the mystery of immortality. And this corresponds very largely with the Western alchemical concept of the elixir of life. This mysterious substance 
that is, uh, properly prepared, properly uh, used, for prolonged life indefinitely. The Chinese have an old character who lived, according to their records, probably around the thousand years BC, who was there as well as to Methuselah. He's supposed to have lived 800 years. And he's supposed to have lived almost entirely on Tao. In other words, he was maintained by the invisible energy in the air. And these uh, Chinese scholars were quite confident that by means of a complete adjustment of their own bodies, their minds, their emotions, their diet, their breath, their thoughts, a complete adjustment with Tao or universal life, that if they could become like immortality, they would be immortal. And there are many legends in their mystical writings concerning these wonderful strangers and saints, like the old teachers of the Jade Mountains, who were gaining the incredible longevity, simply buried by Tao, or as they would have called it, by the elixir, or the magical agent, the mysterious power of the universal life principle. Even the Chinese used the term medicine or substance or mixture to represent this Tao or the free uh, energy in space. Now this approaches early level principle, very close to European alchemy, except that yet we are not catching very many of the alchemical terms that we know about. Uh, the Chinese term of for universal medicine is very similar to the alchemical. But we do not have the paraphernalia, we do not have the resource of the bottles, we do not have the laboratory and the bellows, and we do not have the elaborate alchemical or chemical formula symbolism which we have in Europe. But the end to be attained is almost completely the same. Now this was the first of their concepts in relation to alchemy, the possibility of the attainment of an eternal life, the medicine that heals all mortality and when obtained uh, by the mystic, makes him immune to the evil of the world. Not only is he protected against sickness and age, but he is protected against the evils of any creature that might attempt to attack him or endanger him. He is indestructible because he is identical with Tao, because the interval between himself and universal life has been reduced to a minimum. So, years ago, when I was traveling in Korea, I went into the Diamond Mountain area, and there had the opportunity to contact the two uh, elderly Taoist scholars. And you can't say, probably, that they belong to the same pattern as we find on beautiful old uh, Chinese paintings of um, wonderful rugged mountains and waterfalls and old scholars who under the tree. Uh, they did not have quite that amount of glamour. But from these uh, men themselves, and from the legends and lore in the community, we could get a pretty good picture of how things were a thousand or fifteen hundred years ago, because they were slow in those countries. In the world of uh, tested records in that, uh, in that region, but many of these old scholars were about a hundred years old, and in probability they were. And one look at them would well testify to extreme longevity. There were rumors that some of these had been fifty. And while there was no particular point of the fact that they would ever be immortal, they certainly had exceeded the average person's span of life. They had extended usefulness. Most of them did not require any of the aids that we need in order to keep functioning even at 70 or 80 in our way of life. Uh, one of their principal concepts there was that uh, the secret of longevity is the reduction of friction. And friction must always be the resistance of a personality to the law. In other words, Tao is reality. Those that move with reality fall as little ships upon the surface of the spring and placid river. Those who go against the law immediately come into conflict. And the moment there is conflict, there is death. There is friction, the wearing out of things, the exhaustion of resources, the wasting of energy. It is not what we do that wastes energy, but the way that we do it. And also the hazards, mental and emotional, with which we burden the things we do. An individual in the West has an unpleasant task to perform. He worries about it the days before he does. 
He wishes he didn't have to do it. He tries to find some way of putting it on someone else. And as the time becomes near and nearer, he becomes more and more sorry for himself because he is faced with this burden. By the time the actual task arrives, he is no longer really in good condition to face it. He is dissipated more energy in vain regrets over the circumstance that would require to solve it. Then after his assignment is completed, he continues to be sorry for himself and then develops a radically and heroic attitude and he goes from then on, recounting to others the extraordinary the serenity and this extraordinary courage with which he faced the disagreeable <laughs> <laughs> This uh, is a tremendous waste of energy. And the Taoist would simply advise that the person relax and pull through the circumstance, whatever it is. Face it. Face it without qualms, face it without regret, face it without fear. Whatever it is, it is. You do it as well as you can, working with a complete state of relaxation so that every faculty and power that you have is available. You are less likely to make mistakes, you are less likely to make a wrong decision or a hasty one or an over one. And in all probability, the incident itself will almost evaporate as it approaches. Because you have failed to make it important. By so doing, you will conserve energy and kept the law. Well, these uh, old Chinese scholars say that the answer to all this is simply relax. That if you meet all incidents, simply a factual, simply things to be done this, regardless of whether you like them or do not like them, you take all of the pressure out of them. You take all of the tension away from yourself. And as a result, you accomplish more, uh, you enjoy better health, and no matter how busy your life may be, you have time to sit in your bamboo grave growing and life poetry. Uh, the Taoist monks who have watched Europeans in China and in other countries uh, in their way of life point out that even the busiest man in the West could sit in his bamboo grove if he wanted to. If he only did the things that he is doing now, but did them with absolute lack of tension, he would find that instead of taking all day, it would take two or three hours, and he could write at least one extra poem every day. It depends on how we do things. And in Taoism, the smooth way, the quiet way, the peaceful way of doing everything is the way of immortality. It is also and the best preventive, preventive we know for answers, one of the serious difficulties of our modern life. So all of this lies into one pattern, and that is the Darwin's concept of the possibility that man, by special knowledge, by arts, by sciences, by the investigation of natural law, to finally achieve eternal life. Which they regarded as not impossible, although they did not claim that they had attained it. They did claim that they had found ways of extending life. <coughs> which would indicate that the ultimate goal could be accomplished if man's consciousness was brought into absolute harmony with the universal plan. So that full and complete union with reality would mean not only the end of sorrow, the end of pain, but the end of death. This would then be. We may assume it or not assume it as we please. Now the second thing that was a big concern to China, and not all the things they concerned to China, was poverty. In China, there is no middle class, as we know it, as it never has been. There is the rich, and there is the poor. And the poor are many of the rich and few. And between these two, what we call our great white, our white collar class in the West has no existence. So in the second degree of the concept of uh, art, magic, sorcery, metaphysics. The Chinese developed the idea that comes the closest to the Western alchemical tradition, and that is the transmutation of base metals. He believed firmly that it would be perfectly possible to make gold. Why? Because gold was a symbol of Tao. Gold, as the most precious of all substances, was an appropriate emblem of reality, the most precious of all things in space. As the goal represented the light of the sun, the light of reason, the light of wisdom, the light of truth, so gold represented the great treasure. 
on Buddhism or the mystical or philosophical level could be wisdom. Because wisdom is a kind of wealth that exceeds all the wealth of the earth. Truth is a treasure greater than the most precious diamond. Reality is more valuable than the scepter of the purest day. So all these great and wonderful realities, these truths, this wisdom, all these became associated with the concept of gold. Now the gold, in turn, was associated with the concept of being the king or ruler of all the matters. So Shanti, imperial heaven, was yellow in color. And yellow was this color which, rising in the Taoist period of Chinese metaphysics, <laughs> became the emblem of the yellow road of heaven. It became also the emblem of the imperial house. It was the sign of supreme power. And yellow and gold were religious. So the great goal for Chinese began to develop a concept. If a man should live forever, or would live forever, the practical Chinese would say, as long as he living forever, he's going to be poor forever. You just, can't, you just can't do anything. You can't get anywhere on that philosophy. <laughs> and uh, if uh, you think about the Chinese for a moment, you will realize that with all their philosophy and all their art, they are very practical people. But in the places of the world, too, they're the Chinese merchants. Now, in China, of course, um, a well-fed person who shows a reasonable amount of rotundity is regarded as almost approaching a divine state because they're so pure. Therefore, one of their basic symbols for happiness in this world is to be fat. The fat person is happy. Because you cannot be fat without having something to eat. And in China, an individual who has something to eat is a superior man. He not only is most fortunate, but he must be most clever, or he wouldn't have found a way to get something to eat. The worldly wisdom, worldly power, worldly affluence, all has to be in food. And you, in turn, all has to be in money. So on the physical plane, the Chinese, being always a practical man, instead of uh, doing what some of the Western religions uh, have done, and that is develop methods of medicating for prosperity, decided to go into uh, the transmutation of metals. And, Believe it or not, way back in that period, the Chinese hit upon mercury as being the most important metal or element in connection with their transmuting process. And they associated mercury with a substance called cinnabar, from which mercury could be abstracted. And so cinnabar became the basic material with which they worked in the effort. Uh, to gain uh, the secret of the transmutation of metals. They had a laboratory such as we know, as I mentioned, and uh, your opinion of an old Chinese alchemist, if you look back in that period, you would be representative of a little man seated under a tree somewhere, with a very tiny little stone in front of him, probably about the size of a suitcase, and looking more like a moderate sized incense burner than anything else. And in this stone, and in this little furnace he had, a little cup in which he was working all these materials, and he certainly was not doing mass production. He was working in a very small space with a very small amount of something. But he was very busy and just as conscientious and absorbed in his activity as any Western chemist. But he didn't have a great number of materials, he didn't have a wonderful farm of a to call upon, or shells with bottles and all those things. He was more or less working with one little container. One little group of, of substances which he probably carried in a little box in his sash or something of that nature. It was all done on a very personal or intimate scale. When he was looking for a means of transmuting base metal into gold. And he held that the reason he knew it could be done was because on the level of philosophy, his own base metals, his person, could be transformed. If he as a person could be transmuted from a state of ignorance to a state of wisdom, then on the level of the metals, those metals must be susceptible of changing. Man can change. Man can perform the alchemical mystery in his soul. 
And that which is possible to the soul, by analogy, is also possible to the body. So the Chinese alchemist was convinced that the rules and regulations by which he could achieve his own identity with Tao could be used to bring all base substance into an identity with gold, which was Tao. It never occurred to me for a moment to question that this group of analogy uh, was essentially correct. Now, I've been having a lot of great many accounts of transmutation, so we also have in the East. And there are many old dollars currents, so it's a full of good and able uh, to go on <coughs> indefinitely, performing great and wonderful charities, and by means of the gold in which they were able to manufacture. There was an early element that came in connection with this. And perhaps this had a bearing on it, although we're not too sure of all the elements involved. Unfortunately, we have as much knowledge of Chinese literature as we have of Roman. <laughs> it was probably a change of course of Western civilization, but we don't have it. In the Daoist work, the problem of the production of medicines and the magical formulas for the curing of various diseases developed very rapidly. The Chinese had a strange and rather eccentric uh, group of meditations, but they still were quite true, quite wise, and quite gifted in their ability to treat many ailments for which we have no immediate solution. But in their medicines, one of the most important and priceless ingredients, particularly in their mystical remedies, was gold. Now, you know, as we all know, that it would probably have been very hard for Socrates to have gotten the stock of gold if he had wanted to do any chemical experimentation. He probably never had the price of a one small Greek gold coin, or at least very seldom had it. <laughs> <laughs> These old chemists working with various medications in China were monks. They were two other persons who had renounced worldliness, so called, to go into scholarship and study of meditation. Gold was for the emperor, not for the monks. Gold was not for the old hermit somewhere on the mountains. Unless he happened to be fortunate enough to live in an area where he could maybe mine a little gold or have a little gold himself. For the most part, he had no contact with these elements. Therefore, to him it was necessary to manufacture them. And there is a legend or tradition that the Taoists made gold for a kind of medicine, not for its own sake. Well, because they needed it as an ingredient in something else. Not being able to buy it, not being able to afford to get it, and not being likely to receive it as a gift from under the economic conditions of China. They had to learn some way of making and manufacturing either gold or a synthetic material which had the same attitudes. But in the course of their experimentations, they also manufactured synthetic stones. They manufactured synthetic jade and amber. They perfected a great many um, chemical formulas as the uh, European alchemists to gradually enrich the entire um, code of uh, chemistry through their various researches in related fields. So we have the second of the two desirable things. One is the elixir of life. The other is the transmutation of metals and the formation of synthetic stones, which is the equivalent of the philosopher's stone. So they were working on the same basic story, but they came about it a little differently. Now we can continue to exercise a comparatively powerful influence in China, especially in this uh, metaphysical field, until about the 7th or 8th century, when it began to title with the newly rising strength of Buddhism. Buddhism has been introduced in the southern China about the beginning of the Christian era. Some say slightly earlier, some say slightly later. But there probably was an indeterminate foundation in the first or second century PC and a permanent foundation about the second century AD. So the Buddhism was coming in. And Buddhism uh, was already also passing through a transition period. Buddhism moved into China about to start. But it began to expand its own transcendental doctrines, moving from the philosophic foundations to its own metaphysical foundations. 
And this is the theory of Buddhism that came in with quite a different viewpoint from that uh, which was in China at that time. Buddhism also brought a certain amount of alchemical and chemical speculation with it from India, where for a long time, the scientific research has been more or less intensively carried on. A little later, however, after the rise of Nalanda and some of the great institutions in India, uh, that Buddhist scholarship in art and in science, especially in chemistry, began in which drift towards China and began to mingle its stream with the indigenous culture. Actually, there is not a great deal relating to what we call alchemy in the original Buddhistic philosophy. There is, however, a great deal about the philosophy itself, which is which is reminiscent of the original concept of Tao and the Chinese uh, belief in the possibility of man's final identity with an eternal state. But it was not in the Buddhism so much an eternal life as it was an eternal consciousness in Nirvana. But in its transition from one part of the world to another, in the gradual rise of what is called the Northern School, or the Kala Chakra, <coughs> Buddhism began to take on a great deal of transcendental culture. And over the time it was centered in the Northern group, uh, the rise of Lamaism in Tibet, and the rise of the uh, Great Vehicle, and the Pure Land sect in China. There was a lot of speculation going on, a lot of metaphysics drifting into the Buddhist philosophy. Buddhism, much like Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, had an absorbing quality about it. And when Buddhism struck the alchemical tradition in China and in adjacent countries where this tradition was developing, it immediately accepted it and imposed it upon its own doctrine. So that there came to be an alchemical or alchemistical interpretation of Buddhism also. And this particular phase of the subject is still very largely taught in the colleges of the Alamat sect in Tibet. And these colleges, among their other magical uh, rituals and magical studies, um, include the transmutation of metals, the development of a universal medicine, and the, in, the indefinite prolongation of life. Now, all of these ends, as they were developed in the Chinese, would be rather inconsistent with Buddhist philosophy. But when Buddhism moved into a strange area where other philosophies were already present, it, uh, it became mingled with them in a kind of alchemy of its own. And as a result, there are many doctrines now to be found within the Northern Buddhist schools, especially, that have very little in common with the original teachings of Bhagavan. They represent the minglings of tradition from one school to another. And we are working with this, going even into Japan, where Buddhism and other groups, and even Shinto, have some alchemical tradition. We gradually observe the Eastern group uh, to be concerned with alchemy or chemistry almost entirely on the level <laughs> of a means or a method for accomplishing one of the three great purposes of European alchemy. And the two we have mentioned, namely eternal life and wealth, has a third added in the course of time. And that third added is the gift of vision. It was very important in uh, these systems that the neophyte uh, or the disciple should speak of the speech of <coughs> eternal foresight. In other words, the power of immortality implied with it also a complete and eternal knowledge of all things happening everywhere. An ability to uh, mentally announce the future, uh, to uh, examine into the deepest secrets of the world and of life. And therefore, there had to be some mysterious um, elixir of vision by which the entire mystery of life could be unfolded uh, to the uh, fortunate possessor of this wonderful substance. 
There's another interesting uh, phase of this, is the Taoistic concept that also means the later liquidity. And then it is that somewhere in the mysterious hinterlands of things, there is a place where the Kenai, all the spirits, or the immortals dwell. There is a mysterious, fabulous land far beyond the reach of the average person. And here, the wonderful beings of we see in little figures of porcelain and bronze and wood today, or were supposed to have an actual existence. They were the saviors who had eaten of the feet of immortality and had gone off to join the city of the immortals, where the scholars and the mystics and the alchemists and the magicians all live together forever in eternal bliss. Somewhere beyond those mysterious mountains that encircle uh, the great middle empire. So you are the would-be alchemist, you are a mystic to come. Believe definitely in the intercession of your, those who had already achieved the mystery. Because when you had immortal life and eternal wisdom and all wealth, you were a kind of super being. You might come floating down out of the sky riding on the back of the plane, for example. Or you might step off of your familiar dragon in front of his house someday and explain to him all the secrets of life. Today, people definitely have the belief that there were spirits. And that these spirits possess these secrets. In Europe, you had the same thing because you had elementaries. And Paracelsus even believed that you could get the, you could capture and hold these elementaries or beings, that they could give you the secret of the stone and all these wonderful and mysterious powers that have to do with the control of the elements of nature. So we now have the same the perfect one, the mysterious elder, who has the stone, and who becomes the equivalent of the European adept. And the Taoist adept are these wonderful, pleasant-faced old gentlemen with long beards and high foreheads. They're associated with wonderful creatures, dragons and griffins, and uh, wonderful birds and beasts with knotted staffs and crooked sticks in their hands and carrying bottles and carrying baskets and carrying bags in which all the paraphernalia and wonders of their knowledge um, these would all conceive. Sometimes the genie would sit down on the bag and the bag would put up in space with him. It was anything you wanted. It was magic. And in this second period of Taoism, so everything was magic. And magic also could cause you to communicate with these beings. And these beings could take you to the city of the gods, and there they could teach you this mystery of the stone. They could give you the secrets of, and ponders that you had sought for so desperately and so patiently through the years. So this phase of the alchemical tradition in China parallels very closely after Europe. Uh, the beings in Europe were not quite so fantastic, but the essential principles were the same. But it was possible for you to be, receive instruction from a master of the art would already achieve this. Because in our in our community, it's perfectly possible for you to share knowledge. You lose nothing by it, the other person gains. But your gain is not your loss. Therefore there is no particular reason why you shouldn't help it. In China then we have all of this tradition building up and growing and developing. And it finally comes out to us after maybe thirty two thousand years in what we call the day flower uh, whether in the Moribana school or the Ikinobo school in Japan, the rainbow flowers, the tea ceremony, all of these things, the incense ceremony, all have to do with the same principles, the same rules, the same ideas that underlie the Taoist concept of that. So we'll take a little time to go into that and we'll try to show you exactly what is intended. Now we mentioned in the uh, Western tradition, they have the presence of three essential elements, which must be united or brought together in the mystery of the soul. In the West, they're called the king and the queen and mercury, or sulfur, salt, and mercury. Now in the Chinese concept, the sulfur is called heaven, uh, the salt is called earth, and the mercury is called man. And the great triad in Chinese philosophy, and it finally uh, came into the European thought also, 
Here's the triad of heaven and the man. This triad goes through all of their art, all of their sculpting, all of their painting, every phase of their cultivation. <laughs> and the reason, for example, in Kelly Nassar, Zoe Nagar, that instead of having the wide margin of a picture at the bottom, as we have it, they have it at the top without a margin at the bottom. So we frame a print, we always frame it with a longer margin below and a shorter margin above. We think it's more artistic that way. When we print book pages, we always need more margin at the bottom of the page and less at the top. Whereas in the Orient, they do exactly the opposite. Because the upper margin is always heavy. It must be superior. The lower margin is always earthy. And then between these is the work of art. And this is man. Because man is the work of art. And art is still protecting nature. So heaven and the man must always be represented. Heaven is above, earth is below, and the artist paints a picture in the middle. Therefore, he is man. And in this particular very interesting old mandala here, which is about 11th century, uh, from the Nara period of Japan, you will find down here among the demons at the bottom of the picture is painted with the artist. A little part of the artist. And look at the picture. You can't see it. I am covering up the artist and all that. But sometimes <laughs> But the heavenly earth and man is a bottom, a leaf and a bud, and it's the basis of all flowers, because it must all be triadic. Heavenly earth and man is salt, salt, and mercury. So in producing all of their art works, therefore, everything that they do is a formula. These formulas are so exact in trying to charge that it takes five hundred years sometimes for one of these schools to permit a master to go to the extension of adding one more bottom to a street of cherries, cherry flowers. There must be just so many. And it's a major division and major rise within a school if one more petal is added to a flower. Everything is so completely systematized and integrated under rules and keep talents in law. In Taoism, therefore, we have this over-concept of Tao, containing within itself, within its own eternity, heaven, earth, and man, which also returns to us in the Confucian doctrine, and of course, returns again very definitely in the Buddhistic triad, uh, where you have the three great principles. You have Amitabha, uh, uh, the great the Supreme Buddha, then you have Avalokiteshvara, and you have, of course, the three Bodhisattva. We need to have an earth and man again. They are spirit, body, and form. Now, in this painting, spirit is above, is probably represented by Chinese paintings. Below is matter. In the middle is form. And here you have form, a magnificent composition. Now, form is your chemical combination. Form is your alchemy coming in. Because in this central part it is a formula. And a formula is a pattern in form. You can almost uh, sense the meaning of it from the word formula itself. <coughs> a man is a formula. The stone is a formula. The human soul is a formula. And in the oriental system of art, it is always taught that the picture, the representation, must always be an absolute synthesis of the formula. And the formula is always balanced. The formula is always equilibrium and is always synthesis. China, therefore, picked very quickly upon the three great systems that arose within its own country and created a triad out of Confucius, Lao Tzu, and Buddha. And these were the three famous vinegar tasters of the old Chinese paintings. These three represented the schools, have an American man again. And in this emphasis, you have the problem of equilibrium. And in alchemy, the great problem of equilibrium is the balance of the formula, or the balance of the compound. Because if you bring heaven and earth and man together in exactly the right compound, you have immortality. You have the stone. You have the universal medicine. You have the mystery of all knowledge. And you have complete equilibrium, which is the secret of God. If, therefore, uh, the Chinese began to experiment with this concept, they believed that the great hermetic miracle 
was placed or was uh, was taking place within the great last bottle of the universe. And upon this bottle lay prayed in Egypt, the seal of Hermes. So that we refer to it now as the hermetically sealed bottle. Meaning in this case that nothing can get in or out. But originally it mainly meant that the bottle used in medicine and science were stamped with the mark of Hermes as a sign of the purpose of the experiment and also uh, as a proper sign of medicine or the healing art. Within the great bottle space, the universal or eternal experiment was taking place. This experiment was the generation between heaven and earth of man. Now this generation did not mean man just as a human being. Rather than the Hindu sense of the word manas, meaning the mind or the soul. Actually, the great transmutation was the union of spirit and matter to produce the mystery of soul. A man, because in him, of all creatures visible and knowable to us, we have the only obvious example of soul. And because man is able only to examine himself firsthand, and all other things secondhand, and because man cannot find soul in anything else, because he can experience only himself. Therefore, he became the symbol of the mystery. He became the symbol of the mysterious agent in which the compound of the opposites was achieved in the complete sublimation of universals. Man, therefore, receives from above by the nomadic symbol of fire, and by the nomadic symbol of fire, he receives an influx or an internalization of spirit. From the end beneath him, he receives the ascending uh, influx of matter. Therefore, he has a body derived from the elements and a spirit derived from the stars, as Paracelsus said. And between the elements of the stars, between the earth and heaven, move the orbits of the sacred planets. And these are the seven metals from which the mystery of the soul is compounded. So man becomes the living soul. And as soul, there is achieved within him the equilibrium of spirit and matter. Now to bring this equilibrium to bear upon the alchemical formula, the absolutely true center of the interval between spirit and matter must be found. And this is again revealed to an, on another level of symbolism which is just as perfect and just as extraordinary and about which someday I hope we'll be able to, uh, to talk at greater length than that because music symbol. The Pythagoras step, uh, steps the money board between the orbit of the fixed stars or heaven and the surface of the earth or the elements. And he caused this cord to be marked along its way with frets to break the cord or to break the uh, uh, string of the one string instrument into the harmonic intervals. And he placed one fret in the exact center of the string, by means of which he secured the mystery of the octaves. And in so doing, he placed this fret in the position of the sun in relation to the solar system, the way the ancients studied it. So that he caused the absolute point of equilibrium of tone to correspond with the body of the sun. And he caused this in man to correspond with the spiritual nature of the heart. And this sun, therefore, we come to a gem in alchemy. And from the salt and sulfur, the opposites, mingling together, we have, in spirit, united to matter, the middle distance of the radiant of four, the octave point on the thread or cord. 
And here we have the sun, which is the focal point of the world form, form being the perfect compound of spirit and matter. Now as the sun occupies this mysterious central point, the sun is therefore gold, because the sun is produced alchemically in space by the mingling of the opposing elements. And all the great work of heaven and earth has been achieved in the production of the sun or gold, the core of the great world of metals. In this way, the philosophy of alchemy says that wherever there is absolute equilibrium, there is a sun. And that all planets and all other bodies are off balance. Wherever there is the sun, there is equilibrium. And the moment this equilibrium occurs, the sun becomes creative and causes to move from itself a series of unbalanced polarities and forms a solar system. And when the units forming this solar system are achieve balance within themselves, they each become a sun. They each become a sun and generate again. Now in man, uh, the Chinese say, he receives his spirit from the imperial heaven, the yellow emperor. He receives his body from the great mother. He brings these two, spirit and matter, into equilibrium and produces a son, a human. And this son is the soul. And the soul is therefore composed of gold. Not physical gold, but the same kind of gold that is always created by equilibrium. The moment equilibrium is created in the alchemical mysticism, the gold within a thing is caused to be released. Because wherever there is gold, there is a potential equilibrium. And as I think I told you on another occasion, <coughs> recent doorknock in Switzerland has shown that the gold Colloidal gold is a sovereign remedy for ailments of the heart. Heart, sun, gold, soul. They are all part of one sequence of values. Now, according to the Chinese, there is gold in everything, just as the Europeans have. Now, so what is the gold in everything? What is the seed of gold that must be always be present in every single thing that exists? The answer is that everything has within it the potential of equilibrium. All things have the possibility of being synthesized into balance. <coughs> now, if you remember in the Sefer HaZohar, the Kabbalistic Book of the Splendors, it says, Unbalanced forces perish in the void. Thus pass the kings of Edom and the giants of ancient days. Your titans. Your chaotic giants fighting uh, for control of the universe represented the two great powers, the mother father dragons in China, that struggle together and produce between them the golden ball, which is the symbol of imperial China and also the symbol of the age of the world. When ether and chaos among the Greek philosophers, the Orphics, struggled and strove between themselves, they finally formed a whirling mass which became the golden age of Hades, which burst forth to release the Logos in the creation of the world. So from the strivings, from the struggles of the unbalanced elements, came again the golden age. Now the golden age on earth is the age when there is no conflict, when everything lived in peace together. This was the first and most glorious of the Yugas, the great age of the gods. It is always the same essential symbolism. And gold, silver, gold, heart, sun, and all these relate to this mystery of equilibrium. So the Chinese, naturally, following all nations that have had metaphysical speculation, came to the conclusion that in some way man's own nature, the etheric field, the magnetic body, the aura, the totality of it, was about a crystal moon in which his soul was generated. And we hear in the, in the age of chivalry how Merlin went to sleep in an age of glass. We hear how the hermetic homunculus is created in the womb of glass. 
And we have this glass, which again is the psychic field of the human being, in which the mystery of his own equilibrium takes place. This mystery of equilibrium is represented in the Chinese by the yin yin combination. The circle with the twisted claw in it, uh, which forms uh, half black and half white content of the circle, but the two parts do not divide the circle evenly, but have that effect if we not recognize the connection with one of our large labor companies, which uses this uh, yin yang symbol. And also, I believe it was used for a number of years a symbol by the technocrats. It, uh, it is a symbol of the two half spheres, but they're in motion. So that the hemispheres appear like two sperms or two living creatures, sometimes each one with a dot or eye in it. Occasionally, this field is divided into three twisting sperms and uh, is often surrounded by the pongo and the, uh, the various emblems, the trigrams and the hexagrams of the Chinese uh, eating or classical changes. But this motion of dark in all things is released by the quivers. So we have the problem of bringing the human being to equilibrium. And to achieve this end, we must bring about that which is supposedly the impossible. Because alchemy begins by assuming that the first experiment means the accomplishment of the impossible. And that impossible, as we mentioned in one of the other talks, is to make fire burn in water and water support the flame. It means that we have to achieve the absolute unification of two utterly divided factors. And in alchemy, they say, well, it is done because heaven and earth are man and woman. A man and woman unite and produce the sun. They produce life in it. By their union, they release Tao, and Tao becomes a new being and lives. Therefore, the absolute polarities can come together and do a generation, both physical and spiritual, is under the same rule. But in the problem of man's achievement of the soul, he has a spiritual a spiritual profundity, a mystery that is completely free in space, the unicorn that can only be captured uh, when the virgin ties her staff to his horn. This absolute motion must therefore come into absolute reconciliation with that which is absolute space. space. That which is immovable must meld with that which is ultimately ultimate and eternal good. Spirit and matter, good and bad, light and death, dimensions, up and down, in and out, must all come to an absolute neutrality. And how is this to be accomplished? There's only one possible way in which it can be accomplished, and that is by an art which is capable of dominating and perfecting the work of nature. To achieve this art, then, in the case of man, the hermetic adept must appear. The mystery must be solved through uh, the recognition of the formula of the complete transmutation. Now, in the Chinese philosophy, this formula is stated somewhat differently from the way that it is stated in Europe. And this formula uh, in Chinese philosophy is something like this. The human being has an inside and outside. These are his opposites. Halfway between the inside and the, out and the outside is a focal point which he calls self. Therefore, self, or ego, is a movable point somewhere within the chemical field of the middle of internal and external. Self is sustained from the outside by the sensory perceptions, which are constantly contributing to its existence. Self is sustained from the inside by the descending consciousness into specialized fields of action. So this self moves with the individual. It is a wandering point. When I look at something, I move myself into that thing. 
I stand in front of the picture and I enjoy it very much. Myself has gone out and joined the picture. After looking at it for a few minutes, I get tired of that and I think of myself again and it goes into my pocketbook perhaps and stays there for a little while to make them sure that everything is safe and sound. <laughs> then after a few minutes more, it uh, has another little uh, bit of major and it's still fine. It travels elsewhere. It travels off into something I want to do. I want a vacation next summer, so it goes off and joins the pine trees up in the mountains somewhere while I will get it. Then the self comes back and thinks a little bit about the job it's supposed to be doing to make a living here. Then the self drifts off and identifies itself with family and friends and children and begins to worry about them. Then the self picks up the new do in the uh, daily paper and at this moment identifies itself with the stock exchange. <laughs> this self is moving upon the focus of its own point of awareness. If I have a pain, my self is there. And that is why it hurts. If I have two pains at the same time in different places, my self is hopelessly confused and forgets to hurry neither one. <laughs> because it cannot be by. If I stub my toe, my self immediately anticipates and visualizes the process of falling. When I'm hungry, my self goes out and wraps itself around the concept of food and begins to drive towards me like a little um, a little amoeba or something of that point, or a gastropodia of some nature. But myself is forever in motion. Today, myself has a new idea, and I think Emerson is the greatest father who ever lived. Next day, I find out that Emerson had a bad disposition, so I move over and <laughs> my philosophy centers on Immanuel Kant for a little while until I find out. Uh, uh, he took 10 years to propose to a young lady, and that doesn't sound like a very good philosophy. Little by little, myself moves around. Myself takes out illusions. Now he gets disillusioned, but I hate everybody. I hate everybody but myself. Because I will never accept responsibility for what I do if I can possibly avoid it or get me anywhere else. <laughs> so this self, in Chinese philosophy, can that be diagrammed by something that would look like the uh, track of an earthworm wandering through several feet of terrain. It goes in all directions. Only then we think of the self as a center. <laughs> Uh, from which everything radiates, and which forever remains the same, but the Chinese and the Hindus do not. They recognize this self as something that no matter where it is, that it's opposed anywhere and everywhere. And that it is an unchanged thing, which has to be valuable. And it has to be captured, and held, and trained, like the wild horses of the gods, or no one can ride it. And that in this wandering around and here and there and everywhere, there is no balance. And that the work of alchemy is to draw the self inevitably and irresistibly to dead center and neither there. So that it occupies the position of the dot in the circle. The moment it reaches dead center, it ceases to move and everything else moves around it. This dead center is the true formula, the true point of the precipitation of the soul. Mm -hmm. Now how to get this true dead center involves practically every system of philosophy that we know. We recognize at least seven great systems of philosophy and religion, religious philosophy for the most part. Descending from ancient times. These, each of them, corresponds to the talisman or figure of one of the seven planets. For the seven religions and philosophies radiate the truth just as the seven planets reflect the light of the sun. Therefore, the religions of the world are a series of, of formulas, of metals, which are involved in this transmutation. And whether we like to believe it or not, the essential principles of all these seven must be used to project the stone, because all these elements must release the diamond core which is in them. And the world in which search for the transmutation of the world body or world form into the world soul 
Most and none of the chiefs, all of the chiefs, through the alchemy of the transmutation of the seven planets of the seven great religions and philosophies. They are all part of the same formula and approached on a different level. So here we have man, surrounded by his seven sensory perceptions, five active and two latent. And we have him trying to transmute the wondrous, which is the meaning of the word planet, and bring them into a focal point. And in this focal point, to generate the diamond self. Now the self, instead of being actually uh, the source of these various energies, such as will, thought, emotion, is really the focal point of their own activity. Man's self does not generate his emotions or his thoughts. His emotions and thoughts generate his self. Therefore, the self is often the victim of heredity, bad heredity, in this particular case. The imbalance of emotions and thoughts represent themselves to us as the crippled offspring, like the Egyptian god who was laid at his feet because of the sins of his parents. And in this case, the sins of the parents are the sins of the heart and mind resulting in the deformity of the soul. So we have the problem of getting uh, this projection of the soul, the absolute equilibrium. And in the Chinese thinking, how do we do it? We do it by following very closely upon the basic instructions of Alison. Inasmuch as the Chinese insist that this one, the centralizing self, which is never centered, is forced out of center. That the world is because it has to, and not because it wants to. It's one is because it is the victim of the intensity of the emotions and the thoughts. Whatever we feel, whatever we think, the self must serve. Therefore, we bind the self like Samson was bound to the middle stone of the Philistines. We grind the self as we grind its senses. And we make this focal point the slave of what we may term emphasis. It is the thing by which we attach ourselves to any given object of attention. It is supported by our own will to do these things, by our own desires, by our own strategies, by our own thoughts. And these things are constantly forcing the self out of center forbidding it to return to center, and identifying it with some unbalanced part of its own field. Lao therefore, taught his disciple that the thing that is necessary always is to restore the self to the center. And as the self approaches the center, it approaches the state of Tao. And as it approaches the center, it gains control of the circumference because it can never control the circumference equally until it is in center. How does this occur? Lao says that it occurs by the gradual reduction of the active principle which is the term the energy field in man or the libido. It is achieved by the individual ceasing to be wrecked the motion of life. The moment the individual ceases to force life in his own way, or some direction, or some activity, life immediately returns to equilibrium. Therefore, illumination is not something that the individual must desperately attempt to attain. It is something that he is desperately attempting to prevent even while he is constantly talking about its desirability. It is not that this path of the of Tao, the road which is Tao, is as difficult as the symbolism suggests. It is that the individual himself refuses to walk in a straight line. He refuses to permit the principle of Tao 
to operate. I'm going to use an, 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 old, an old example, taken from one of the Chinese classics, uh, to point this to change. And it seems that there was an old master who had five disciples. Of course, the five disciples were the five colors, the five elements, the five provinces of China, the five everything that we have in this mystical uh, situation that we are dealing with. Five elements. Chinese have five elements. We have four, but the alchemists have a fifth, Azoth. And we have a hypothetical fifth, which we call Ether, and about which we are not very certain for the most part. But this old gentleman had five disciples, and he told them, he said, I want you to travel all around the world and return and tell me what you have seen. Well, in his day, that was quite a task. So it was many, many years before they all got back. But they did, because they were all good Taoist disciples, and they, <laughs> a great protecting power went with them. So after many years, they returned, and each one of them told the master where he had been and what he had seen. What said the master? I told you to go everywhere. You have all been somewhere. <coughs> but not one of you has been everywhere. Because there is not one of you who has visited every place. And they said to him, Master, we couldn't do it, and you're back. The old man says, No, my son, you couldn't do it if you started out. The only way you could do it was to stand here. And while you have all been somewhere, I have sat here and been everywhere. In other words, you cannot go there by that method. But if you attain a certain condition within yourself, you are there. Which may also explain why so many of these old mystics felt that their great service to mankind consisted of sitting quietly under a tree. Taoism would teach that they could do more for humanity under a tree if they knew what they were doing. And they could, by running up and down the world, preaching, teaching, hoping, and fearing, learn how to convince the Because their contribution would be on a level of quantitative penetration, while everyone else would be running around on a quantitative level. So in the problem of Taoism, the return of the consciousness to the plane of equilibrium is attained not by the victory over self through great stress and strain, through wrestling with an angel, or something of that nature. It is simply by the gradual release of the individual from pressure, from the pressure of action. Now we come to the conclusion from this that the Taoist uh, advocates a philosophy of non-action. He does. Not because non-action is negative, but because non-action is all action. There is no possible way of achieving absolute motion without passing through the state of absolute transition or transcension of motion. The alchemy says you can never erase the elements and they are conformed. You have got to reduce them to essence before they can be caused to mingle. Therefore, you can never, by any process that we know, Take the various elements of the personality and force them into the union to produce the stone. Before they can be created into the stone, they must all die. Paul says, unless the seed dies, it shall not live again. And Taoism says that unless action dies, the individual can never achieve absolute action. Can never achieve absolute motion or the complete motion of Tao. To achieve this, therefore, he must transcend motion. And in so doing, he attains absolute motion. And there is an analogy which he gives of the axis of the wheel and the rim. And that actually, the axis is the only point in the entire wheel that has achieved absolute motion, although the rim is moving there more rapidly. The axis is the only part that you can actually slip in. So Taoism is absolutely equilibrium. 
And then they obtained payment of it by the reduction of spirit and matter to their basic elements, to their basic principles, but a complete separation of them from action and inaction and new motion. They precipitate the motion of Tao, which is absolute action. And this is the absolute stone. This is absolute life and absolute immortality of the universal medicine and the absolute source of life. Because all of these things depend entirely upon the individual achieving absolute balance within his own consciousness. When he achieves that balance, he then generates, he then achieves the creation of the crystal modulus. Because out of that balance, the union of spirit and matter within himself is born his own psychic his own psychic nature. And he becomes a living soul with a spiritual core and a new transcendent nature or transcendent being, as the Chinese call it, within himself. This being is like the Taoist human. It goes everywhere, it rides on the unicorn, it rides on the dragon. It is absolutely uh, free from fetter and bond. It achieves everything by becoming completely free of everything. It is the only free spirit in space. And it is the only thing that cannot die. Because death is always unbalanced and conflict. And if these two cease, there can be no death. So the Bible soul of Mormon Buddhism, which supports the world, Vajrasattva, is the same thing, the same principle again. Buddhism has the same essential symbolism in the tremendous dynamic inaction of its religious art. <coughs> the majority of the Buddhist figures sit serenely upon the blossoms of a lotus. Ask their eyes half closed in complete posture of the pose. Symbol of transcendent action. Symbol of the experience of Buddha and representing to the Chinese consciousness the experience of Tao. Now, once God has been established within the individual, and the inaction becomes dynamic from within, every motion, every action, every manifestation of himself has to be with absolute rhythm. From that time on, anything that he touches becomes priceless because of the perfect energy of his own country. Anything he does, he does perfectly. If you stand for that, if your uh, technique in your Zen issue in Japan, a feeling in art. When the Buddhists or uh, other religious artists decides to paint a religious painting, he doesn't get a model, he doesn't start him making sketches, he doesn't go through any of the procedure of the Western artists, who may do almost anything from chewing his pencils up and down. <laughs> the first thing that he does before he paints a religious subject is to realize the free subject must be released. It must express itself from within himself. Therefore, he begins by meditation. He stretches himself where he's going to use it. He sits down quietly in front of it and enters into an inner experience of life. And he gradually releases from his own consciousness, his own understanding of the thing he wants to paint, moving it from within his own internal computer. He gradually visualizes under this piece of stone the complete picture that he intends to paint. He does so without any effort, without any strange velocity, uh, without any question as to whether he's going to be right or wrong. He simply permits it to visually unfold, projecting his own internal contemplation and his own visual power as though it was a magic lantern casting a reflection of a picture right onto this piece of silk. And in some instances, it has been known that the artist would sit and look at the piece of silk and meditate upon it for two or three years without taking so much as a piece of crayon or, or an ink slab in his hand at all. Then having completed from the living cells the full projection of his artistry, he suddenly takes his little brush, takes his little ink slabs, 
in the ten minutes of getting there. As one author said, it took him ten years and ten minutes to meditate. Everyone thought he worked on it for a long time. He worked for ten minutes and he grew for the ten years. And the combination was a great work of art. This is the motion from within. This is the idea that the Chinese try to express it now. That it is the Tao, or universal rhythm, coming now. And finally possessing the individual that makes it possible for him with an infallible spell of his breath, which never needs to be corrected. In Chinese art, you never change the line or you never correct one. <coughs> it has to all exist within your consciousness, and even your hand has to be so accurate and so completely possessed by the picture that many Chinese artists, when the time comes to paint it, paint it with their eyes closed. And never had to change the mind. They had visualized this thing and hands of actually visualized. The great uh, Shingon monk in Japan, Koko Daichi, had such tremendous concentration of power in this particular situation that he placed a brush between each finger of both hands, remained in meditation until he had completed the contact of his picture. Get the brushes this way into ten different slabs, each one with a different shade. And with his eyes closed, painted the picture with ten brushes at one time. Because there was absolute concentration within his own consciousness. Now this is the stone, as far as China is concerned. This terrific power. This man can never do anything in this world. <laughs> because his own incredible internal can sustain him to anything. And in the air, a holy man going through the forest is seldom molested by an animal. But then he tells his consciousness will not commit. In the uh, Eastern Chinese uh, concept, the entire projection of this, from within itself, is so tremendous that it corresponds with what the Western alchemist calls projection. He uses the term, the European alchemist. And he is able to release the stone, release the dynamic, release the universal medicine through himself. But it also a story in China of a great artist priest who was called a chen to a man's state. And uh, after he had sat and watched the sick man for some time, this monk asked for a piece of stone. He was set before the sick man on a little frame such as they use for painting. And after watching the sick man for a certain time, the monk reached over, dropped his brush into the ink slab, raised the brush, and made a peculiar line on the stone. Just one line. The sick man got wet. Well. Because the monk had captured the peculiar rhythm that was broken. And as the eyes of the sick man followed the rhythm of the line, it destroyed internally. The badger claimed to have done the same thing by striking one chord of coming a loop. He was able to cure all kinds of sickness in that way. It was a symbol of the line. So in Japan, also among the Zenjus. And uh, you will find the table or legend of the monk entering into meditation of the most profound nature. And in his meditation, he drew a door for a piece of stick. He sat and watched it. And according to the story, he visualized that door. Finally, he got up, opened it, and went through the silk to the door. Now, the these things, and are no more remarkable than the idea that Roger Bacon was able to take the to the Crusades by artificial gold that he manufactured the town of They're all parts of this story. The story which has been ridiculed because of its outward appearance being sheer fantasy. But a story which has to do with the entire internal life of the human being. A life which is controlled by the centralizing of consciousness. Uh, Daruna, the patriarch of Zen, uh, had an episode in his life that is a little reminiscent of the story.
starting to find the New Testament. So I went in and meditated one day. When he walked along by the side of the sea, and after he was long in his meditation, which he suddenly sort of came out of this trance like condition of ecstasy in which his mind was one with the infinite, and suddenly, to his amazement, observed that he had walked out several miles under the surface of the water. The moment he realized he was out there, he sank. <laughs> and as long as his consciousness had been held in complete suspension, he didn't know it. He didn't see it. They also tell many similar stories about the power of this eternal. All of them say that this power is real. That it is possible to achieve this tremendous victory over the mind by the complete integration of the luminal part of the internal nature. This constitutes not only a victory over the world, but a victory over the great cyclic laws which control the activities of the early light. Buddha is said to have risen victorious over the power of the seven planets. In the same way, the alchemist transmuting the seven souls to make up his psychic nature and attaining complete transcendence over them and causing them to form the diamond soul or the great adept self achieves complete release from any limitation conceivable to the human mind or emotions. Therefore, he is completely without stress or strain. He is without tension, he is without needing. He is without any imbalance within his own nature. Therefore, like space itself, he is immortal. This was the Chinese concept of the transmutation, and I believe that the European concept under the symbolism, was practically identical. There is no question in the world that this symbolism moving into the Near East uh, influenced Arabic thinking, and much of our so-called chemical speculation came to Europe from Arabia, and from Iran, and from other areas of the map, general region. These uh, chemical and, and uh, physical chemical experiments are interesting for another reason. Which came first? Was alchemy the mad mother of chemistry, as some would have us believe? Or did physical chemistry arise from man's gradual recognition of great symbolical patterns within his own psychic nature? Is chemistry one of the expressions of the soul itself, interpreting itself through the symbolism of medicine and uh, chemistry, and to a certain degree, in philosophy and mathematics, all of which are involved in this subject? I am inclined to say that the alchemical symbolism arose out of man's own psychic recognition of these laws, and that man attaining to a degree in sleep. The relaxing contention which he does not experience in daily living. That in sleep and dream phenomena, he comes a little nearer to the threshold of this equilibrium. Sleep is probably a kind of equilibrium on a negative level. It is a kind of transcending of action. Therefore, sleep, death, initiation in the mysteries, all of these were always carried under one group of symbols. Sleep was always a symbol of death, death was always a symbol of initiation. <coughs> because it represented a transformation, a complete change of polarities. And in alchemy, the death of the night, the death of man's seven soul, must precede the resurrection. And from the, in the Christian alchemy, from the death of the seven souls arises the messianic soul, which is seen as Christ rising from the tomb within the bottle of the alchemical experiment. If then we have this group of symbols all over the world, they seem to be trying to tell us that there is a strange and secret art 
a non finite man may break this vicious circle of his own inadequacy. And whether we call this alchemy, or whether we call it Raja Yoga, or whether we call it mysticism or Sufism, or whether we believe it to be the religion of the dervishes, or paganism, Gnosticism, or Arachnid, whatever we call it, it is all dealing with the glory of the and that is the projection of the dying soul. And that this dying soul of alchemy is the soul in equilibrium, by means of which the individual becomes completely akin to what we're going to allow to call Tao, or absolute equal uh, receptivity to universal energy. The universe around man, within man, is Tao. According to Lao Tzu, this universe is not only infinite life, but the infinite wisdom, truth, love, law. It is not only all these moral things, but it is infinite nourishment, infinite supply, infinite availability. Everything that exists consists of Tao and nothing else, because there is nothing else. Everything that changes is Tao changing the appearance of itself. In his numerous and multiple appearances, Tao assumes to be many things, but it's in its essence, it is one thing. Man, using the faculties which he has on the level of man and emotion, looking at the universe, sees many things, but does not see Tao. Yet each of the many things that he sees is Tao. Therefore, he can say Tao is white. And you can also say Tao is red. You can say that this sky and earth, that this water and air. You can see it in the eyes of his child. You can see the being with his own breath. All of these things are Tao. But because of his nature, this Tao is infinitely broken up. And he can also see the phenomena of two things outside of himself in war with each other. He can also experience two feelings or two impulses within himself at war with each other. Therefore, he experiences through the division of his own faculties, Tao as infinite diversity. He comes to it on an Aristotelian point of view. He cannot see the tree for the leaves. He cannot see the city for the houses. He may go so far philosophically as to admit that all these houses are part of the city and that all these leaves are part of the tree. But in consciousness, he is experiencing the many leaves and not the tree, because that is what the faculties reveal here. He looks out and he sees 10,000 stars, but he does not see the one star. For that star must be born with any star shining out of the east of his own soul. He sees all these things and he is profoundly moved by them. <coughs> and he says, God is wonderful. God is glorious. God is beyond estimation because God can maintain all these things. And that there is an infinite power somewhere that can beat these thousands of millions of worlds, uh, radiant and rotating and revolving in their mysterious orbits in space. Therefore, we come to the concept of deity as infinite immensity absolute power, tremendous authority. But always there is the star and the earth. There is the water and the moon. There is man, there is hunger, there is death. The man lives in this tremendous experience as within a great vessel. And he knows that he is living in a world of absolute energy. Yet he must work with his energy to transform it so that the work in a combustion motor. He must work in another way in order that he shall work within his own body to maintain him. He is living in a world in which energy is available, but must be constantly conditioned and changed. He finds it also possible to die of starvation in this world of absolute food. He finds it possible to die of ignorance in a universe of absolute wisdom. He finds it possible to die of loneliness when he is constantly in the midst of everything he lives. 
These are because she has not experienced God. Because he has experienced only the manyness. He has never experienced the tremendous dynamic of the dying himself or the soul. So gradually, through the experience of manyness, he begins to recognize the necessity of reuniting broken parts. And he creates formula. The formula is nothing but a method of achieving an end, a scientific method for accomplishing a given purpose. So we have in these great esoteric systems like Buddhism and in the teachings of yoga, Vedanta, and Taoism, and many others, he has the discipline, the formula, for the shifting of this things from manyness to oneness. From the experience of God at all, the experience of God as one. A one which contains the all. Or the experience from the experience of God as infinite action to God as inaction, which is the free action. Now our concept of action and inaction is that when action happens, we're doing things, when inaction sets in, we're not doing anything. The Chinese say that's no, not in here. That's because we are looking at it from our level. The truth of the matter is what we call Action is the supreme inaction in space, and what we call inaction is complete action. Therefore, that the motion is not from action to inaction as positive to negative, but from action to inaction as from negative to positive. The Tao and Tao alone is positive action. Why is it positive action? Because it is the only action upon which all things depend and which in itself depends upon nothing. Everything that lives lives because of Tao. And yet try and find Tao. Try to find this complete suspension of action. Try to find Tao as the teacher. It will never speak. Try to find it as the friend. You can never embrace it. Try to find it as nutritious. You can never put it on a plate and eat it. Tao is in this. Therefore, the experience of Tao is the experience of infinite. And the individual moving towards the free mind finds that absolute action is absolute experience of infinite. And all else, comparatively, is inaction. Thus, internal action is supreme, and external action is comparatively unimportant. The only reason we have to run up and down is because we do not know where we are going and would not know if we got there. Thus, and when the Taoist seeks this internalization, he is bringing together all of the disunity of his own psychic chemistry. He is reintegrating the seven souls to form the great soul. And he is then transmuting all activity First into suspension of action, and finally to release to it Tao action. He tells signs or burns up or exhausts all of his own personal action. And out of the ashes of this, by coming to Jesus, he causes the flower of gold to grow. Or as in China, the little peach tree of gold, upon which are the blossoms and fruit of immortality. Out of the complete calcination of all of the negative aspects of action, he releases Tao through action. Tao is the tree. In the Chinese formula, when man ceases to make mistakes, the great virtue operates. And it cannot operate until he stops making mistakes. So, wisdom lies in ceasing to make mistakes. It doesn't lie in knowing all. It lies in no longer breaking laws. And then this state is reached, this state of equilibrium. Then the goal grows. The seed of the soul is quickened by the suspension of action or by the reconciliation of broken parts. And immediately it grows. Then he gives the same story 
and the um, excuse of magic. The spirit of the soul rising from the root of gold is nothing but thou growing up from the seed of equilibrium in human consciousness. And when this has achieved and achieved, this, all, this tree also carries the twelve fruits which are for the healing of the nations. It is the tree of life. It is the sacred soma plant. It is everything which is for the nourishment of all that lives. But when this tree blossoms within the human soul, then we have the wonderful tree of the metals. We have the wonderful tree that is guided forever and guided within the secret garden of alchemy, in which there are many drawings and figures of the ancient books. And also, in a strange way, this is the very peach tree under which Lao Tzu was born. Because he said he was born under a peach tree. Well, now everyone is, uh, assumes uh, that this is merely a little historical episode gathered from somewhere. But the tree under which he was born is the tree of immortality of the Taoist paradise. And no one seems to pay any attention to that at all. So that when he was born, they didn't name him up to at that time. They named him little peach tree he is, because he had very large ears and was born under the peach tree. <laughs> now why did he have very large ears? Because Tao is in the very religion of very large ears and a very small mouth. <laughs> The last three minutes and talk for many, many years and left over 5,000 characters per night to summarize his entire philosophy. Taoism is not a philosophy in which you uh, do a great deal of talking. It is a philosophy in which you are forever accepting into yourself, not giving up. But in accepting into yourself, you prepare for the release of the splendor of the sun, for once this tremendous jewel of immortality is cast within yourself. You burst into a sun. And from that time on, you are raised warm and preserve all life. And you become the parent of another order of life. And a new set, a new series of peach trees lies in the garden of immortality. And having achieved this, and having perfected oneself in it, according to the Taoist theories of the transcendental period, not the original period, also did not have this particular concept, but it followed in his teaching. After the achievement of this um, adequate, <coughs> after the wonderful mystery of the soul has been detected, then the old Taoist adept goes off to seek the land of his brothers and lives forever with those like himself who have made the transmutations. Now, in the Greek legends, I think we can <coughs> see pretty well what happens, what is meant. <coughs> And for what happens when the Greeks achieve a great heroism and then die? Why, the gods always pick them up and make reflections of them. They were always set in the sky, and therefore you have stars named for all the heroes and nymphs and all the wonderful beings. The crown of Semele was taken up after death, and the chair of Andromeda was taken up from the winged horse Pegasus went up there. Everybody became a constellation after they had uh, made good, so to say, in whatever of their problem might be. So the old hours, and that they got through, they went up to heaven and became stars. What is the star? Just another symbol of the diamond soul. It is just another symbol of the radiant sun around which any water of life is going to grow. Because when men cease moving around the center, they cease to be planets and become suns. When human beings cease to move around their own centers. They cease to be wanderers and they become sages. And as they become sages, they become alchemists. And sitting quietly within the mysterious nature of themselves, they take that little furnace, which is the heart, which has the long within it, the point of fire and light, and in this heart they accomplish the creation of the universal medicine and the wise man's stone. But in the West, we had a lot of equipment to do that with, and they did even in the Middle Ages. Because we have never yet realized, as fully as we have yet realized, how some of these things are, are and how always the symbolism is internal, regardless of the fact that we insist on building a laboratory and setting aside fifty million dollars for research. <laughs> then we need to really get it. And the Taoists would really do us how to face, although in, on the outside, being the Taoists would probably agree with us and chip in four dollars to help them the back. It would be quite necessary to answer the fool according to his policy. <laughs> but in the alchemy itself, 
in all this internal mystery of man ceasing to be a planet and becoming a sun, ceasing to be a base metal and becoming a star, ceasing to be a series of separate parts, each struggling for supremacy, and uniting these parts in their death and resurrection, that they may all become the vehicles or manifesting centers for the dissemination of Tao. For when this complete equilibrium is reached, and the silence and the mystery by all parts mingle, by the seven colors unite to restore the white light, and that center Tao moves through. And moving into manifestation trans transforms man. For a planet is one who is moved to the sun, but the sun is one that moves the planets. And the spiritual source moves other things and is itself unmoved. But those who have not achieved this source are forever moved and have great difficulty in moving anything themselves. So in alchemy and the Chinese viewpoint, it is this creation of equilibrium and the release of the eternity growing into the tree bears upon it the three great mysteries, life, immortality, longevity, and eternal death. And this is the, the great traitor. This is the traitor of the Arabian Night campaign. This is the traitor that all men come to see, and to which they turn after all other traitors have failed. Now, as much as can be discussed about these subjects, but I think this is perhaps a little oriental slang on the Western subject. It may help to make this a more rounded out uh, series of discussions. The place of philosophical, the second, the very sentimental, and the third, the theological. Uh, these periods are roughly divided into about six to seven hundred year periods. Uh, each of these sections would thereby correspond to something resembling six hundred years of development and systematic uh, re-adaptation. In the first six hundred years of Taoism, the sect was essentially philosophical and essentially a very high form of Eastern absolutism. And Lao Tzu was not only a mystic, but a very profound theist in his interpretation <coughs> of the essential principle of Tao or universal being. How many have Lao Tzu passed on before his followers, disciples, and several other Chinese scholars who became distinguished in the descent of the system, began to expand and elaborate the essential principles which he had taught. This period of expansion resulted in several recensions of the basic texts of the Jews and terminated about the beginning of the Christian era, or shortly thereafter. During this first period, we have a parallel with the first period in Buddhist philosophy, which was essentially a powerful ethical agnosticism. Uh, but gradually, it became evident in popular usage uh, that the abstract principles of pure philosophy did not have sufficient vitality for masses to result in any strong development of sects or groups. The pure philosophy was simply too deep for the average person and did not come close enough to his own living experience. That was the gradual transition to some restriction on the basis of it was God or life. That boy, we are a little bit unhappy today over overly refined sugar and overly refined flour and various homogenized dairy products because we doubt their vitamin or vitality content. So the Chinese in this early period were speculating as to the essential abundance <coughs> or deprivation of nutrients or nutrition within the various elements of food and the various uh, means of <coughs> concentrating Tao within the body of the human being. So we begin to speculate like this. What are the principal ways in which energy can come to the person and be distributed throughout his body and nature so that he may unfold or grow or come nearer? 
uh, to the full uh, expression of his Tao content. And the Chinese came to several conclusions. They divided this field into three essential parts. The first uh, they called breath. Now, the moment they began to talk about Tao and breath, they began to come very close to the yogic systems of India. They held in China that Tao was in the air, and therefore that to inhale was to accept Tao into yourself. This is the breath of life, or the living breath. Air in its eternal circulation was symbolical of the endless motion of the Tao principle in the universe. So the problem was to increase the intake of air, which they did by various disciplines. Also, through the development of esoteric arts, uh, to use the will or the consciousness to distribute this air within the body so that it could be more rapidly brought into direct contact with vital organs, nerve centers, and brain centers. Uh, they started in. This evening we have several minds of tasks to perform, one of which is to survey a little more of the historical side of alchemy. This time, by paralleling the rise of alchemical tradition in North Africa <coughs> and its development among the Chinese. Chinese alchemy is quite different in spirit, methodology, from the European approach to this subject. And because of its comparative antiquity and the way in which it developed, we may have a clue to the obscure origin of European alchemy. We've already noted that the great rise of the alchemistical symbolism with its extravagance in use of emblematic devices and elaborate formulas coincided with the rise of the other mystical schools in Europe and it should not be regarded as an agent, as is popularly supposed. Now in China we find what may well be uh, the building up of the pattern that finally led to the rise of European symbolical alchemy. In China, this mystical art is associated with the cult of Taoism. So we'll have to examine for a moment Chinese philosophy, where in China, alchemy stems directly from philosophy, a link which we do not have in the West. We're not sure of the relation of these groups. But from the study of the Chinese, we may well begin to re-evaluate our Western historical approach. Taoism arises as the result of the teachings of the obscure Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. Passed through three distinct stages in its development, place, in which a series of compromises by interpretation increased the uh, romanticism of otherwise abstract mystical learning. So, beginning around the first century AD and continuing to the fifth, seventh century, Taoism passed through what we would call a transcendental or purely metaphysical period. And it was in this period that alchemy arose among the Chinese. And it arose among these Taoist monks and scholars and sages who began to think as much in this manner concerning the essential teachings of the original uh, master, the ancient master. If universal consciousness, which was the goal, was to be achieved by man, then there must be certain methods or means whereby this consciousness can be more closely associated with the human being. And the Taoists, taking the attitude based upon um, a very brief statement in the Tao Te Ching, <coughs> came to the conclusion that Tao, or the universal life agent, the universal principle, existed in everything, 
but it was more abundant in some things than in others. Therefore, in order to increase Tao in all consciousness, all life, being, in his individuals, he should gradually associate himself with those things in which this principle is most abundant. It comes very close to the Paracelsian theory of Buddha. The certain living things had a larger share of this essential energy than other things. We believe that in a different way, on a scientific level, today. We believe, for example, that certain foods contain more nutrition than others. And to the Chinese, nutrition, the essential example, is a formula like this that the disciples instruct him by inhaling and then counting his heartbeat before exhaling again. He would start by inhaling, holding his breath, and counting his heartbeat up to a hundred. Every time he should exhale. By doing so, he would increase uh, the duration of the energy principle from the air. It remained longer than in you. Also, at the same time, if we gather more uh, negative or useless material to be disposed of. In other words, the Chinese reflect on this process of body cleansing through breath. They held that the sage, to practice over a period of years, could finally reach the point where he could hold the breath and count to 1,000, which would be quite a long time, probably two or three minutes. And also, during this period of time, uh, would accomplish what they call body cleansing. Now, the second part of that was that Tao is absolute rain. And you can uh, estimate the parallel between, for instance, this Chinese policy and Western calisthenics. You can see a good Westerner get up in front of the window, open it up, beat on his chest, take a deep breath, and back to the explosion. <laughs> this is uh, it's a way of getting everything. It's not subtle by any means. But then the West is not subtle. But the Tao is well subtle. So he told them what to do. He said, before you do this breathing process, you can take a feather and suspend it on a very fine thread or hair about six inches in front of your face. And in the process of both inhaling and exhaling, you must not disturb the feather's motion. You mustn't cause it to sway or sway or move. In other words, you must both inhale and exhale very quietly, without any sense of pressure. You must not hold the breath until you burst and it all comes out in one fell swoop and blow the feather across the street. You have to do this all.